Cody Green was caught during the To Catch a Predator sting of Fort St. Georgia. He was 20 years old at the time and believed that he was talking to a 13 year old female. Over the course of this video, I will review the chat log between Cody and the perverted justice decoy and then take a look at the confrontation with Chris Hansen at the sting house. Keep in mind that the information available to us is just a small window into Cody's life, a window that I'll be using to speculate on what may have been going on with him at the time of this incident. The commentary that I provide on this situation is for entertainment purposes and is a way for me to share my perspective on a criminal subject that has interested me for some time now. If you choose to watch this video, I hope that it sparks reflection, thought, and healthy discussion surrounding this difficult and uncomfortable subject. Let's dive right in, shall we? The start of this log I find to be a little confusing. I'm unsure if Cody and this decoy were talking on another platform or the log wasn't recorded correctly, but it appears here that the decoy actually initiated contact. Do I know you? I don't know. Your name sounds real familiar. How old are you? 13. How old are you? Oh, then probably not. 20? Too old, right? If the decoy did strike the first contact, this is a pretty big red flag for the perverted justice team. As my understanding goes, a solid entrapment case could be built around the predator not making the first contact. After poking around for where she lives, the decoy for an unknown reason goes silent for a while, leaving Cody alone for just a little under half hour. Whilst the decoy is unresponsive, Cody doesn't follow suit and proceeds to try and get her attention. I understand that then. From a different state? Looking really cute. Oh, your parents let you use the computer? So you want to know me? Okay then. You aren't going to message me? Hello? Okay then, never mind I guess. Anybody on that wanting to get freaky? Group message? Just a joke in all actuality? Mad at me? Sorry, computer froze up. So Cody has just learned that the person he speaks with is a minor, and whilst she is unresponsive, he tells her that she's cute. On top of this, he jokingly mentions, anybody on that wants to get freaky. Even though this is a joke, I would say the line is a pretty clear indicator to what it is Cody is looking for with this person. And the fact that he so relentlessly pursues her when she's not responsive is a rather telling sign. Once the decoy comes back and lets him know that her computer froze up, they talk a little about it possibly being Cody's webcam that caused her computer to lock up. Because the webcam may be the problem, they decide to send each other pictures to their email addresses and details, including their names, are exchanged. Cody lets her know that his street name is C. Greasy, because apparently being greasy and living in the South is something that was thought of highly. Forgive my lack of knowledge on street lingo here, but that makes no sense to me. I'm most definitely going to need some of you all to let me know what on earth Cody is talking about here. A quick Google search led me to believe that people pronounce the word greasy differently in the South, using a Z sound rather than an S. Furthermore, a bit more digging enlightened me to a few more entertaining details. Greasy can be used for someone who always knows the right thing to say. A smooth operator, so to speak. It can describe when a woman's lips are too oily, or if someone is a hot mess. It's a term that refers to a person who smokes marijuana, and amusingly enough can be used to label a sexual lubricant. I'm so damn confused right now, it's pretty beautiful. I have no idea what's going on. All I can say is that Cody sure is greasy by my definitions of the word. After this, the two discuss Cody's car, and the decoy expresses that she would love to drive one day. In predatory fashion, Cody tests the water again a little by saying, I could drive you around one day if we made a couple promises. Okay, what? Well, it's a long drive. Would you really be ready to hang out with me and it'd be okay? It's a strange thing to say as he doesn't clarify what being ready to hang out with him means. I'm pretty certain we all know where it's going. Yet still, I don't like how he is playing this. He's using something that the miner really wants as leverage to prepare her for his upcoming sexual requests. He really only wants to talk to this young person for one thing and one thing only. And he is probing the area to find out how it is that he will bring up the core of his intentions. The chat potters along again and they now discuss rap music for a bit. For a split second, the chat log does seem to resemble a somewhat normal conversation between two humans. There is a bit of flow back and forth, and Cody seems relatively engaged with what she is saying beyond the usual predatory intent that I've become accustomed to. This really doesn't last long though, as Cody gently nudges the conversation down a more sexual path. Cody says, Would you want to do some bumpin'? Laugh out loud, what's that? 
Listening to music and having sex? Oh, laugh out loud, you wanna do that? Would love to, honestly, if you would like to. Okay, never done that, lol. Awesome, I'd definitely appreciate being your first. It would be fun, just trust me, I swear you can. You don't mind I'm a virgin? If you don't mind me taking it from you, I actually would love it and never have been with a virgin. His keenness to take her virginity is on full display here, as he mentions that he would appreciate being her first. The way he says it sounds transactional. It's as though he has little to no understanding of what emotional connection a young girl may have to their virginity, or the experience overall with their first time having sex. She has something that he wants. She seems like she's pretty chilled with throwing it away. So he asks her for it, as though he's asking a mate for a few dollars. It sounds like he has thought about this for a long time now, taking the virginity of a younger person. And this is noticeable as after he discovers her age, he did not want to let the conversation go so easily, even after she became unresponsive. The decoy asks him to bring condoms, and he says that that isn't even a problem. When the decoy doesn't accept this response and further states that she does not want a baby, Cody in his ill-informed state lets the decoy know that she is too young to have one. He then oddly enough says, I could show you that this is true by giving you some of what I find on the net also. I'm unsure what he means by this. Is he saying that he'll print off some articles that show that a 13 year old can't get pregnant? It's a confusing little sentence. I initially thought it meant that he would show her some sort of pornography, but the more I think about it, it seems to make more sense that he's trying to convince her that she is too young to have a child. The next troubling thought that arises from this though, is that if he truly believes the words that he is saying and that she is too young to conceive a baby, that means that he's really on the prowl for a child. He doesn't want some hot looking teenager that he can convince himself she's mature and old enough for this experience. He wants a child, someone whose body hasn't even begun the process to cycle through her menstrual phases. The decoy again firmly firmly states that she doesn't want to risk it, and informs Cody that she has in fact begun her menstrual cycle. Cody realizing that he may have been in the wrong, then agrees that pregnancy could be a possibility. Still, he really does not want to use condoms. Instead of directly stating that he will bring the condoms that he owns, like a true gentleman, he opts to ask her this. Would you let me come in your mouth? Um, yeah, if you wanna. I would love to, okay? After this, the decoy lets Cody know that she'll be free this coming weekend, as her mum is going out of town. Cody confirms that she will definitely be alone. No other family like her brother will be there. Cody wants to have a phone call with the decoy, but the decoy says that she must depart for the night, as her mum is not in a good mood. The next morning, Cody apologizes for not sending his pictures to her as he promised he would. I find the way that he delivers this message rather interesting. Hey Maddie. Sorry I never sent my pictures. I was also chatting on AIM with some people. I didn't want you to think I was just not doing it because of anything you did, okay? His statement on an emotional level conflicts with itself. On one side, he tells her that he was chatting on AIM with some other people. Mentioning this could serve a few purposes. One being him wanting to let her know that he is in fact popular. His existence is vibrant and a bunch of other people enjoy talking with him. They enjoy talking with him so much that it takes up his attention and he wasn't able to fulfill the promise that he made to the deacon earlier. It's a sneaky little way to show someone that, hey, I'm pretty cool and you're not that important to me. Me talking to you is a privilege and you are very lucky to get any of my time at all. That pickup book called The Game was written around the early 2000s, wasn't it? Maybe Cody just got himself a copy, hey? Right after saying this, he follows it up with, I didn't want you to think I didn't send them because of anything you did, okay? At this point of the sentence, he is displaying care, understanding, and empathy. He shows that he has the ability to think outside of his own emotional bubble and look at the emotions of others. Cody is aware that, hey, this young girl discussed some intimate things with me about sex, about her family, and I promised that I would send her some images of myself. Seeing as I didn't do it, she could be wondering, was it something that she said or did? So he lets her know that it was nothing that she said or did. Overall, his sentence is an emotional contradiction. Manipulative people tend to use their victim's emotions against them and utilize confusion to their advantage. Causing confusion can lead to insecurity and vulnerability and once they can get their target into that headspace, the manipulator will then provide the solution of stability. They create dissonance and then provide a stable pillar to rest on, an oasis from the chaos. Whether Cody is aware what he is doing is another story, but that is how this sentence would be purposed to work on the minor. An hour after this message, the decoy still hasn't replied. 
So Cody sends the promised photos, one of them being a naughty one. The decoy soon responds and they begin chatting again. At some point, Cody changes his screen name from Perfect Buddy to C Greasy. The decoy takes note of this and amusingly says, Yeah, why aren't you using your other screen name? Just switch him up when I feel like I have a different type of mood. Oh, you don't feel like a perfect buddy today? Cody gets into discussing his new grills and what they're gonna look like, letting the decoy know that he thinks that girls are scared of his current pair of grills. I'd argue that they're scared of more than the grill, hey Cody? The grill talk goes on for a bit and that transitions into Cody really wanting to have a conversation with her over the phone. I really want to have a long talk with you, okay Maddie? Just to make sure that this is what you want. I know first times are a big decision, and I want you feeling fully comfortable before anything like that. Sound good? Yeah, I'm cool with it. We can talk on here. Better. My mum won't hear. You could have my heart then, dear. True. Aw, you're sweet. Notice how Cody has begun to use words that resemble a loving and caring dialogue. The sort of things that someone may say to a partner. Possibly things that the child may have heard on a Disney movie or something like that. He is in the early stages of grooming, and I'll take a look at this behavior a little closer further on as it escalates. More predator chatter is exchanged. Cody wants a hug and thinks that they'll be great friends as long as she is truthful. They ponder the possibility of swimming at her pool, but Cody wants to make sure that they have high walls so that the neighbors don't see, and the decoy asks Cody to bring her a gift. Cody obliges to this, but says he'll need to keep it underneath. I wonder what he meant by that one. Possibly he was thinking of bringing one of those nocturnal plants, the ones you gotta keep out of the sun, hey? After all of that chatter, Cody says that he's developing feelings. Trying to make me fall in love with you already. Laugh out loud. Think you already are. Definitely. It is just a nice, warm feeling I get from you. Me too. We will have to truly get down. Do you have a nice stereo system? Yeah, we do. Even outdoor speakers. Oh my. We will have a blast then. Are you really ready to get to know me as much as I am for you? There are different types of child sexual predators, and the studies that aim to understand these people are detailed and varied. Some of the men that prey on children fall into a category known as situational, whereas others are preferential. Situational offenders may not have a preference for children, but for reasons exclusive to that individual, they commit the offense. For example, one may have unmanageable sexual urges, and in this particular place and time where an urge is present, a minor is their solution. Preferential offenders are people who have an interest in children over adults, and more or less place themselves amongst the presence of children to be closer to what they are attracted to. This second category, it appears to be what we are witnessing with Cody. Many preferential offenders engage in grooming behavior, sometimes for a long-term period, and here is an excerpt that resembles this in textbook fashion. Yeah, you want to tell me what we're going to do? I'd really just like to chill with you at your place, so we can have some growing time for one another. Then we could maybe go and watch a movie, or get out to go have fun. That all? Like a video game place, bowling alley, movies, any of that. It'd be your choice. Okay? We will talk more about it. I mean, I'm not sure of what you like to do all the time, so really anything you want and think we could do legally, I will take you to. Just can't have you drinking or anything to go out, you know? Staying in is okay. And I would remain a sober driver if we were going anywhere. Okay, good. Don't think we will have to only do that, but I'd really just like to have a nice time and give each other pleasure in being friends. Reading over his words, it would appear that Cody is fully aware he is dealing with a child. It would not surprise me if this situation were real, that they may have gone to the movies, where he would buy her candy and take her to arcades. He would get on her level and become a trusted friend, and then from there, the sexual advances would occur. If he felt as though the girl was comfortable enough on their first meeting, he would likely place a sexual advance on her then. But if it didn't happen, or if the advance was rejected, these meetings would likely still occur over weeks and months, and after many innocent hangouts, what is certain is that the sexual advances would not be far off. Coming up, Cody shows a flash of responsibility with his remarks about smoking cigarettes, but it very quickly turns towards deviancy once more. I smoke cigarettes sometimes. Would you want me to bring them or no? Yeah, that's cool. Gotta smoke outside though. Okay, but really, I want you to know, you should never smoke. Same thing for my place, so it's definitely okay. Yeah? You really could help me to stop with them even. How? Just have always had one fantasy I wanted to have happen so I could quit. Yeah, what's that? Did you say you are ready to have my thang in your mouth? Um, yeah, if you want me to. Okay, good. Is that your fantasy? I have to go help my parents and move my truck, sorry. Yes, but I will catch you later, babe. This moment is slightly confusing. 
One second he's telling her that she shouldn't smoke cigarettes, the next he proposes the possibility that she could help him quit this bad habit. Before I dive into the stranger details of that comment, I always find it concerning when a predator will warn the decoy about the dangers of smoking, drinking, or even hanging out with creepy old men, but they will never turn the lens of worry to the scenario that is unfolding between them and the child. It goes to show that any possible display of concern for the child's well-being is all an act, because if they did have a hint of care for the safety of this person, they would shut the conversation down instantly. Back to his remark about the cigarettes though, he says she could help him quit, and the way this help could be delivered? Well it's simple really. He's always had a fantasy and he won't quit smoking until that fantasy has become a reality. It makes complete sense to me, no red flags there at all. Every cigarette he smokes is another bullet to his health because he hasn't been able to fulfill his dream. A motivator so to speak, a goal for him to focus on, a goal to achieve for the purpose that it will save his life. Fulfilling this fantasy is the only thing that will prevent him from slowly killing himself with these awful sticks that deliver disease and illness. What is that fantasy you ask? Well he wants to have his thang in her mouth. That'll do it. That'll get him to quit. I rarely am lost for words with these logs, but I don't really know what else to say. The logic here, it makes no sense. It makes so little sense that I'm just gonna move along with the chat. You win this round, Cody. You broke my mind. Both parties continue the small talk. Little jokes here and there are made, and nothing overtly sexual is discussed, which I do find a bit more troubling than the sexual discussion itself. As mentioned earlier, this man is in full swing of his attempt at grooming. Everything is puttering along at a constant pace until a strange conversation about money is had. There is no mention of money leading up to this moment, and then Cody says, Does your mum leave you any money? Yeah. Not that I will care to take it from you. Laugh out loud. Just want to teach you a little thing about earning money early in your life. She will want receipts though. Oh, that's straight. You can spend your money on your own self. I swear I won't need to touch it. Laugh out loud, okay. You are good enough for me to get my hands on. Completely speculating here, but it appears Cody is concerned about paying for all of the things that he mentioned he could do with her. She has requested he buy her drinks and chocolate, and he's also spoken to her about taking her to the movies, the pools, an arcade, and even on long drives. All of these things will cost money. I think he has asked her about the money to see if she can chip in to cover some of these costs. When there's a slight bit of pushback from the the decoy, Cody tells himself, ah, don't worry about it, she'll be worth the costs. They make plans to meet up the next day, but Cody lets her know it will have to be after 6pm as he has an appointment with his probation officer. I wonder if Cody was going to tell his PO about what he was up to right after, hey? He tells the decoy that he got into some car accidents and this has put him in trouble with the law. After doing a little digging, it appears Cody was involved in a major car accident when he was 16, an incident that left him with quite a severe brain injury. The injury sustained was that of a subdural hematoma a bleeding of the film that surrounds the brain and causes pressure to pin the brain against the skull. This can be quite a dangerous injury and in some instances requires surgery to relieve the pressure. It is documented that after people sustain brain injuries such as this, they can experience an array of changes on their personality, one being a lack of impulse control. As I was digging around online looking at Cody's background, many people seem to sit on either side of the fence. Did his brain injury count towards his pursuit of this child? And furthermore, did it contribute to his blunt honesty that you'll see later on when Hansen arrives on the scene? The chat presses on with more predator chatter as Cody asks a few questions to see how much he means to the decoy, and then they have a brief phone call. After the phone call, Cody mentions that she sounds perfect and so cute, and then he has to go and move his truck because his mum is complaining. Coming up, the chat then begins to fall back into uncomfortable territory. So may I ask a naughty? Yeah. Okay, cool. But if this isn't for you, don't worry about it. Just curious. Okay. Would you let me stick my... in your behind also? Um, will that hurt? It is something you would just have to grow accustomed to. Do you know if your mum has any vibrators or dildos? No, I don't think so. It's cool, just curious. Would you even be comfortable with us using that anyway? On either of ourselves? I guess if you wanna. I wouldn't mind if you wanted to do it to me, but like I was just saying, it's just an option. Putting aside the rather gross thought that he just asked this child to potentially use a sex toy that her mother uses, he has expressed that he would be open to the idea of this toy being used on him. He either is saying this because he is genuinely interested in that experience, 
or more to the point, he's trying to show the girl that he is willing to undergo the same punishment that he wishes to dish out. He's probably hoping that saying he's open to that experience would make her more open to the idea of doing it as well. And then when the moment comes around, he's going to hope that she does not opt to return the favor. I wonder how this conversation would have panned out if the decoy grabbed onto this bit of information and ran with it, making it abundantly clear that when he arrives, he will be having this device placed in his rear. The topic doesn't end there, with Cody revealing that he has actually tried this before. You have one? My mum does, but it's old, and I don't think it even vibrates anymore. Oh, laugh out loud. You tried it? Yeah, once, but I wasn't too much a fan. Just wondered what it would be like if I ever tried it with a girl. I really don't have any feelings for guys besides friendship. Okay. So my thoughts earlier about wondering what would have happened if the decoy took this idea and ran with it may have slightly come true. The decoy shows a hint of interest in this topic and Cody starts to backpedal straight away. He lets the decoy know that he has tried this out before but he didn't like it. And his dislike for it was not because it felt uncomfortable, it's just because he only likes guys as friends. It seems as though he's trying to subtly tell the decoy, hey, it wasn't for me, so I probably wouldn't want to do it again. But only because I'm straight, you know? If you like guys, you'll probably love this. They then move on to the next topic, which is travel time to the decoy's house, and this is still interlaced with many sexual overtones. From here, Cody wants to know if she shaves and if her mother would approve of their relationship, which the decoy lets him know that she would not. As they continue to talk, Cody wants to know if this is a setup and says that he really has no interest in going to jail. He also doesn't want any trouble and confirms that her mum will definitely be out of town and that the whole situation just seems a little too perfect. Perfection to a predator really seems a world away from my idea of perfection, hey? Cody jumps on the webcam again, but also lets the decoy know that he is in fact talking to other women using this cam. Even though he's just told her that he's speaking to other women, he quickly follows that up by offering the girl compliments like, you are my reason to smile. They talk about his fascination with hats and shoes and that his room is really messy, the platinum highlights in his hair and how much he loves jewelry. The decoy notices that he's not wearing his grill which sparks another dialogue about his grills and soon the decoy says that she must go to bed. Coming up next, we see Cody express his love for the decoy and wants to show her something. Love you, Maddie. You too, Cody. May I show you something I'm going to feel insecure about tomorrow? Kay, I have just been working too hard under the sun lately and getting too sweaty under my clothes. It's my buttocks. I really want you to be honest, okay? Okay. Sorry, I know it is gross. I've read way too many of these logs now as I was totally expecting him to show his penis. The butt pick is a new one for me, hey? Very unexpected. It would seem that he has actually gotten a rash on his backside and he wants to show the decoy this to prepare her for how gross it may look the next day. But just hard for me to get rid of it. It's been like two days since I last really started sweating. It is just from my skin getting irritated on my behind and my sweat getting into my pores. I'm really not dirty. Just hate having to sweat too much and it makes me get to feeling dirty mentally. It's okay, I don't care. Okay then, baby. I'm sorry this had to happen around the time we would meet, but you know, shit happens. Laugh out loud, yeah. I will still love you just as much. You want to see my ding dong? Ah, there it is. I was wondering when that thang was going to make an appearance. Hopefully it can make up for that rashy backside, hey? Graphic warnings are coming up, so please turn your volume down now if you're around people. Cody wants to try and get her to put it in the back of her throat, before telling her that she'll just be perfect for him. He tells her that sex will begin to feel good after they do it a couple of times, and that he will go slow for her first time. He asks if she plays with herself, and then poses the question if he can film them whilst they are doing it. When the decoy asks if he won't show anyone, Cody says, It will just be for my viewing pleasure then exclaims that he could get into a lot of trouble for this. He's really going all out in this section of chat, and it doesn't stop there. It seems that Cody's first lesson into the world of loving intimacy is asking if she would suck his nuts. I can feel the love emanating from his words. It's truly romantic stuff. Whilst this is going on and Cody is still on the webcam with his penis exposed, his mother walks into the room behind him. Um, who's that? Ha, my big mama. Ooh, she almost caught you. She has gained a lot of weight, but she is a nice lady. Ha. She did. It happens all the time. Laugh out loud, really? You're not embarrassed? Nah, I'm straight. Have to maintain my composure and play it like I was doing nothing wrong. She see your thing out? Nope. Why I stood up? 
I promise I won't take it out for nobody until I see you tomorrow, okay baby? Apart from the obvious, disgustingly yet amusing notions of this moment, there is one line in here that strikes me as important to point out. I have to maintain my composure and play it like I did nothing wrong. This tells me that this young man is no stranger to deceit. He's speaking to a child online. His penis is out in full display, and his mother walks into the room behind him. He casually stands up and maintains full composure. He doesn't panic or close windows or quickly try to whip his pants up. He is well versed in the arts of lying under pressure. I wonder how he will fare against the immense pressure though that Chris Hansen will be putting on him in just a few short hours. The rest of the chat plays out pretty much the same as it has so far. He wants to suck on her toes, he's worried that his PO officer will take longer than expected, and he discusses how his skin is sensitive to soap. He wants her to rub herself and muses over the thought of having sex with her in the hot tub. He expresses that smoking has made him feel dirty again and that he needs another shower. And before they go to bed for the night, he tells the decoy that when he gets to her house, he wants her to scream a curse word as loud as she can so that he knows no one is home. This is a sign that he has either done this before or has thought about how to handle this moment in great detail. They go to sleep and continue chatting the next day around midday. Strangely enough, this late in the chat, religion makes its entrance and Cody wants her to pray for them to work out. He also wants her to pray whilst she is rubbing her clitoris. He tries to educate her on how best to masturbate and asks if it's okay that he only stays one night. Would you mind if I was only able to stay one night? I have to go to a funeral in Louisiana. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, who died? Well, she is on her deathbed. It's my stepsister's grandma. I could be very mistaken on this matter, but I have never heard of a funeral being organized prior to the person's death. As the meeting draws closer and closer, his demands get stranger and stranger. Laugh out loud and don't forget condoms. Let me go take my shower. Already got them packed. Okay, laugh out loud. I could also buy more if these aren't enough. I have like six. Is that enough? Probably. Okay, good. You're gonna drink the... out of every last one of them, okay? Okay. If you wanna, I can try. Definitely. Maybe I won't let you. But just if you want to, would you give me a golden shower? What's that? Pee on me or in my mouth. Oh my god, you want me to do that? Isn't that gross? It's hard to know if he genuinely would like to partake in these activities with the girl, or if he's just lost in a fantasy sex land in his mind, and in this very moment, he's just saying whatever gets him off. Because the decoy is not saying no to anything, he's just left to fall further and further into the pits of his mind, bringing up desire after desire and waiting for someone else to pull the brakes, cause he sure as hell isn't. We have a bunch more predatory graphic chatter about his boxes being juicy and hoping that hers are the same. And then with a few more I love yous, Cody sets off for his date with his dream girl, Chris Hansen. Maddie. Yeah, I made some tea and it's on the table. Did you bring me my chocolate? Hey! So, why don't you just step right over there, please? Should you have a seat right in that chair? Please sit down. I'm eating the green with so I swear. To I, I need I need you to sit down and you can tell me all about it, I promise. Please, sir, I really drove this far for no reason. You drove this far for no reason? Yes, sir. I swear to you, I asked her, and I swear to you, I asked her this. I you asked You asked who? I asked Maddie. T -t Take your time. I'm going to let you explain the whole thing. Yes, sir, it's fine. I said, if this is really not what you're looking for, I really want you to tell me that. Because I will come over, and I will, I swear, I will just be with you, and I will not touch you, anything like that, is what I said. And I can prove that to you. I will show it to you. You'll show me how. Please, I really, I swear, sir, I'm a desperate person. I need a girl in my life, and I'm, if she really wanted to be my friend, that would be all I needed from her. I've never hurt anyone. I've never done anything. I would not have hurt her. Let's take it back and have a look at that entrance. The tea is on the table. Did you bring me my chocolate? Hey! Sounds like you really gave Hanson quite the fright there. Why don't you just step right over there, please? Should I have a seat right in that chair? 
Please sit down. I'm in agreement with this. Uh, I swear to I, I need I need you to sit down, and you can tell me all about it. I promise. Please, sir, I really drove this far for no reason. I drove all this way for no reason is a pretty feeble defense as no one really does anything for no reason. This line leads me to suspect that he is quite fearful that the imposing figure who is Hanson knows that the dialogue between him and the young girl was sexually charged. The exclamation of no reason, I believe, is his way of saying that he wasn't there for any sexual reason without having to explicitly say the word sex. It's a way of acknowledging the more sinister intentions of his presence, a stab at honesty to showcase that he does have integrity, all whilst not attracting any unnecessary heat by outright stating what those dire intentions are. You drove this far for no reason. A minor observation is watch how Cody's blink rate increases. I swear to you, I asked her, and I swear to you, I asked her this. I you asked, you asked who? I asked Maddie. T take your time, I'm gonna let you explain the whole thing. I said, if this is really not what you're looking for, I really want you to tell me that because i will come over and i will that's 13 blinks that we can observe in under 15 seconds the average blink rate is between 10 to 20 blinks per minute and studies suggest that an increase in this can be attributed to the human mind undergoing psychological pressure something i'm very certain cody is going through right now i swear i will just be with you and i will not touch you anything like that is what i said and i can prove that to you i will show it to you You'll show me how. Please, I really, I swear, sir, I'm a desperate person. The intensity his stare emits as he maintains eye contact with Hansen is unreal. Whether he believes what he is saying or not is not the focus of my attention. What is of interest to me is the way that he delivers this information. It seems to be a genuine shot at conveying integrity once again, and he is not afraid to let Hansen stare right down into his soul whilst he does this. Please, I really, I swear, sir, I'm a desperate person. I need... A girl in my life and I'm... The revelation that he is a desperate person falls in line with my interpretation that he is attempting to show Chris that he is an honest person. And it displays a level of self-awareness that is not common seen in these predators. By this point, where most other predators I've looked at begin to wriggle and squirm through their lies, Cody has decided to sit in the uncomfortable pain of this moment and let Hanson know exactly where he is at. This desperation, whether it be fueled by an inherent attraction to minors or not, has led him to this point place, and he is now putting that on full display for Hanson to do with it as he pleases. I would opine though that his main goal here is to use honesty to squirm his way out of trouble, and has chosen this path due to his awareness of the serious nature of the crime that he attempted to commit. If she really wanted to be my friend, that would be all I needed from her. I've never hurt anyone, I've never done anything, I would not have hurt her. Cody says that I would not have hurt her, and the believability of this statement is both high and low at the exact same time. As mentioned earlier, I would say that Cody falls into the fixated preferential category of child abuse offender. And the reason I say that I think his statement here would be high and low believability is because I think that Cody would be willing to play this game for the long haul. He may not have hurt her on this occasion, which is what he is being truthful about with Hanson right now. On this occasion, occasion, they may have had a wonderful time together, laughing, joking, and innocently playing. He may have even made a sexual advance or two, but if it was rejected, I speculate that Cody would have backed off. But not from her entirely. It just meant that he hadn't put enough effort in yet. I imagine this man would have hung out with her again and again, had good time after good time, until his grooming is complete, and she no longer puts up a barrier to the sexual advances. When he says that he wouldn't have hurt her, what he fails to realize is that in this moment, his presence presence, no matter how surface level innocent it may seem, is destined to harm her eventually. Even if she were to consent to sex one day, for this man to push his existence towards hers which will forever shape her journey as a young teen, he is taking something away from her that she will never be able to get back. He is making her face decisions and scenarios that we as a society say, only adults, or young adults at the least, should face. He ignores the fact that this game in which he would like to play is destined to harm the girl psychologically at some point, no matter how consensual the events could have been. On top of this sheer lack of care to the damage one can cause this way, it is all rooted in utter selfishness. Would Cody be hanging out with this 13 year old if he didn't find her attractive? I think not. He doesn't care about her as a friend. If his grooming were to take place on a real young girl, she would be building an emotional connection with someone who she believes to be a real human being that cares for her, when in reality, she would not have a meaningful friendship with Cody the person, but instead a facade created by the desires of his penis. Now what did you bring with you? Chocolate, like she asked me. 
and white chocolate that yes sir that's what i told her i was bringing what about condoms yes sir i have them also but that was not my intention i swear to you sir what were you gonna use the condoms for she told me to bring them also so you did everything just because she told you yes to. sir i swear to you that is the reason for it then why did you send her pictures like this Cody's eyes widen once he realizes what Hansen holds in his hands, but utilizing the same technique that he did when his mother was behind him during the chat log, he maintains his cool. Why did you send her pictures like this? Because she asked me to. She asked you to send she pictures? She asked me to send new pictures, I know. Right. So there's a big difference between sending a photograph of yourself and sending pictures of your genitals. Did you say you are ready to have my thang in your mouth? Yes, sir. What do you mean by that? Are you ready to have my d in your mouth? What a moment, hey? One of the more famous amongst the To Catch a Predator community. A combination of Cody's ridiculous statement, Hansen's matter-of-fact reading of the statement, with his perfectly timed eye contact and head wobble, and then Cody's minimal reaction to his own words as he silently confirms that this is what he said. The silence then broken by what could be classed as one of the most honest moments on this program. Disgustingly honest, but honest nonetheless. Did you say you are ready to have my thang in your mouth? Yes, sir. What do you mean by that? Are you ready to have my d in your mouth? Do you know what I meant? Because she was, she was going with it. She was. Oh, so she wanted it. That's what it it's seemed like fault. to me. She says, "You don't mind? I'm a virgin." You say, "If you don't mind me taking it from you, I actually would love it and never have been with a virgin." I know it's not respectful, but I was just asking her if she wanted to do that or not. This is not even like I was just looking for girls that were this young and I was looking to get in trouble and everything like this because I was telling her this. I was like, this is illegal on phone conversations, on online and stuff like that. And I was like, you swear to me, you're not going to get me in trouble. And I swear I will never disrespect you is what I was pretty much meaning. To so you're the victim here? No, sir, I'm not the victim. I came here for, yes, for reasons like that. but. If she really didn't want it, sir, I swear to you, I would have never tried it. But if she was open to the idea? Yes. You would have had sex with a 13-year-old girl? Probably, yeah. Why? Because it's so alluring to have sex with a 13-year-old girl? It's just something that you, you'll probably never have again. That would be probably the cleanest, best pleasure. <sighs> hmm. What does one even say to this? I'm in half a mind to just leave it there, shut the video down and call it a day. To start, I really have to hand it to Cody here. That level of honesty, despite the intention behind it, is something I don't think many people would be capable of. Cody really doesn't seem like the sharpest tool in the shed, nor does he strike me as the dullest. There's a few things that lead me to believe that he's not the dumbest person out there. The way his sentences were structured throughout the chat log, although not Shakespeare, did have some form of flow to them, and his ability to have fun with language was present. I didn't highlight the parts of the log, but there were times where he joked about being a robot, and it was really not that poorly written. Humor is quite often linked to intelligence, as a sharp wit is highly regarded as a mark of a brilliant mind. I'm not saying that Cody here displayed signs of a sharp wit, but compared to other predators, whose chat log is completely devoid of humor, Cody at least made attempts at it. The reason I bring all that up is because this level of humor leads me to believe that he has a level of awareness about the world around him, that far surpasses that of some of the other predators caught in this sting. Cody knows how to somewhat dress, knows what to drive, and importantly, he has a set of standards in which I imagine would classify as cool in the world in which he has chosen to model his outward appearance. I would suspect that sleeping with a 13 year old is not on the list of things that give him street cred. So for him to sit in front of Hansen and admit that sleeping with a child would be the cleanest, best pleasure is so out of alignment with the character that it seems he is trying to portray that it borders on unbelievable. Was he uncomfortable as he said those words? Was it a relief for him to say them out loud and get them off his chest? His outward demeanor after saying it doesn't give us an inch to begin to make assumptions about how he was feeling. He just states it, matter of fact, like it's pretty normal stuff. 
I'm very glad that this man was caught in the sting operation, because if left alone in the world, I imagine Cody would have eventually found himself a young girl to groom, and that may have eventually led to him experiencing his definition of the cleanest, best pleasure. But if she was open to the idea, yes, you would have had sex with a 13-year-old girl? Probably, yeah. Why? Because it's so alluring to have sex with a 13-year-old girl? It's just something that you do probably never have again. That would be probably the cleanest, best pleasure. I would say. The cleanest, best pleasure yes, sir. is to have sex with a 13-year-old girl. Yes, sir. You can't meet any girls who are 20 years old? No, sir. I really can't. You got that nice truck out there? Yes, sir. Got the clothes thing going on? That's, that's material, sir. Girls... Girls look deeper for what they want in guys. You know? After such a blisteringly morbid display of honesty, he follows that up with one of the more insightful predator moments. That's, that's material, sir. Girls, girls look deeper for what they want in guys. You know? His awareness that women want more than just material goods. His nice clothes and fancy truck don't mean anything in the eyes of a woman should his personality be lacking charisma and character. It's a bit of a sad moment, if only for a split second. It's a glimpse into the insecure dark corner of his mind. A young man who recognizes that human emotional connection runs far greater than surface level materials, and having recognized in himself that he may not have the substance to sustain such a connection, he tries to hide the hollow shell that he believes himself to be with material belongings. Well, there's something you got to know. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC. Yes, sir. Have you seen one of our computer predator shows before? No, sir. This is one of them. We're doing stories on adults who try to meet teens on the internet for sex. If there's anything else you want to tell us, we'd like to hear it. If not, you're obviously free to walk out that door. And that's Cody Green, hey? Earlier, when Cody said that he is a desperate person and needs a girl in his life, it works in conjunction with the moment where he says that girls want more than just material possessions. This man holds somewhat of an understanding of what the opposite sex desires, yet instead of taking this knowledge and applying it to his life, working hard at becoming someone who is worth the effort for a woman to talk to, he chose the opposite route, to chase after minors who haven't yet formed a fully functional idea of a deadbeat adult or a worthwhile one. And how how they would like to navigate around these people. It is somewhat sad to think of a person like Cody who is fully aware of what it is they lack to be considered attractive to a partner, and then be completely defeated by the hill that they would need to climb to become that person. But then, to make matters transition from sad to downright disgusting, instead of taking that defeat and trying to work with it, they sink to the pits of predatory behavior. After Cody's arrest, whilst awaiting trial for the charges acquired from this sting, Cody would expose himself to an eight-year-old girl at a swimming pool. He cited that it was his brain injury and a lack of impulse control that caused him to do this. He was arrested again for this incident and then held in custody until his trial. He was evaluated whether he was fit to stand trial due to his prior brain injury and the judge deemed him fit to stand trial. He pled guilty to attempted child molestation, attempted sodomy, and attempted statutory rape, and netted three years in prison with an additional nine months for the incident at the swimming pool. Then after that he had 12 years on probation. Upon release he was required to live at home with his parents for an unspecified amount of time, and is now classed as a registered sex offender. Yeah.